church. Good to see you. Good morning, online campus. Great to see you as well. I'm fired up, guys. I hope that took you to the throne. Man, I needed that. Thank you, guys. Thank you, gals. You guys always take us to the throne and point straight to the Lord, and I'm grateful. I hope you remember those words. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. There's a word again. You know I, I don't like that feels thing, right? Because our feelings lie to us. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? If you haven't lived long, trust me, your feelings are not reliable. Listen to this quote. I read it this week from Russell Moore, okay? It says this. For far too long, we have called unbelievers to feel, to invite Jesus into your life. What if I told you Jesus doesn't want to be in your life? Your life's a train wreck. Jesus calls us into his life. And his life, unlike ours, isn't boring or purposeless or static. His life is wild and it's exhilarating and it is unpredictable. Wow. I love that. That is so true. It is exhilarating. Following Jesus is unpredictable. And it takes a bold faith to do that. And that's why I love, I wouldn't trade our faith for anything in the world. Even when people start to question it. Even when persecution begins to ramp up. And hear me, it's coming. Even when you don't feel a holy connection to your father, it is still there. God is faithful. And today, that's what we're talking about. Overcoming doubt and walking in faith. Taking a step to a place you may not even see is in front of you. And here's the ironic thing. The key ingredient to walking a life of faith is faith. Go figure that one out. The key ingredient of having a bold, faith-filled life is actually faith. The author of Hebrews says this, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Think about that. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And that's why I love you guys here today and you assembled online all across the country. When we come together and we form the koinonia of this church, this ecclesia where we can worship God. Man, I thought I was going to lose my contact lenses this morning just hearing these voices wash over me. All of us united. All of us humbled before the Lord. John 16.33 says this. This is Jesus' words. I told you these things so that in me you will have peace. Because in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. In other words, have faith. I have overcome the world. I love what Martin Luther King Jr. says. He has this beautiful quote. He says, fear is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. Isn't that great? Even when it's rickety. Even if you're at the top of the stairs and you, uh, that light's not going far enough. And you, you're questioning, should I take this next step? I'm talking to somebody. Should I take this next step of faith? I can't really, ooh, that's a creaky step. I don't know about that. Or maybe you're walking a road that is missing a step. Or maybe your road is broken and you are feeling it. And you look around at the brokenness in this world and you think, 2020, can it please be over? <laughs> can we just fast forward to January 1 and see what happens? Can we, just, can we just hit the reboot? Maybe we don't set our clocks back and we just, maybe it'll go back to factory settings or something. We don't have to worry about that. Anybody else feel like that? And I look at this and I think, if there's one message we should take away during these times, as the church, as the ecclesia, as the body of Christ, it's this. God is faithful. God is faithful. Yesterday, today, forever, unchanging God. He is faithful. Even when we can't see it, even when we don't feel it, he never stops working. So today what we're going to do is we're going to go back to Mark 5. All right, you can go ahead and open your Bible and pull that up if you want. Mark chapter 5. Remember, last week we were there and we were looking at Jairus coming to Jesus and presenting his, his request, saying, Lord, would you please come? My daughter's she's not doing well. She's, she's probably going to die. Will you please come and heal her? And this amazing thing happens. Jesus is like, yeah, absolutely. And he sets off to go heal this daughter but something weird happens. He gets interrupted. We have a Jesus interrupted moment. And he's interrupted by another miracle he's about to do, which is so, so cool because it is such a precious miracle. I want you to notice how the Lord interacts with females. I want you to notice the tenderness 
I want you to notice the love. Not just the one that we talked about several times. I love talking about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery and stone. Oh, the woman at the well. This is a different one. This is so, so amazing. All right, so they're headed off to go heal Jairus' daughter. And this is where we join the story already in progress. Look with me, Mark 5, verse 24. A large crowd followed and pressed in all around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Think about this poor lady. This situation, just by itself, just what we read there is awful. And it is incredibly difficult for her to even be in this position. She has a medical condition, right? She's seeing doctors. She's not improving. In fact, she's getting worse. And to add insult to injury, she has spent all the money she had in the process over these 12 years. She might have been wealthy at one time. We don't know. But we know her bank account is empty now. And the doctors have not only not helped her, she's worse than she was before. No options left. She literally is desperate. All this has gotten her nowhere. Now, we think that by itself is bad enough. Guys, we are missing something. Hear me, modern day America, we don't get this. But remember the world she lived in at this time. To be back in Bible times, this is so much deeper. What a lot of people don't realize is that her condition branded her an outsider. She was literally declared unclean. She was ceremonially unclean. And according to Jewish and Levitical laws, y'all, that's like a nuclear bomb going off. Being declared unclean excluded her from everything, every form of worship. She couldn't go to the temple. She couldn't even go to a synagogue in this condition. Think about that. Totally cut off. If she dared show up at the synagogue, do you know what the punishment was if she stepped one foot near the mount? The minimum punishment, 40 lashes. That could kill somebody. That's the minimum, all the way up to being stoned to death. All because of this condition. Think about that. So not only was she feeling this, her family was feeling it. Every chair she sat in, every bed she slept in, every doorknob she touched was now, if you came along behind her and touched it, you were now considered unclean and would have to go through the purification. Think about this. This affected her every single day, not just the pain, not just having an ailment, but she was feeling loneliness and debilitating issues for 12 years, unable to connect with her community or have family or friends over to her house unable to share with anyone, no relief from the pain. Now do you understand how desperate she is? So it's with that that she has this incredible act of faith. She comes up, and a tremendous miracle is about to occur because of her faith. Keep reading. Look at verse 27 with me. It says this. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes... I'm going to be healed. And immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was momentarily freed from this ailment. doesn't say that. She was freed from her suffering. It's all been building to this moment. This is the climax. As we come to this, this woman fulfills her intent to go step out of faith, to reach, to touch the hem of his robe, and she has a complete, immediate healing. It's not over the next several hours. It's not as she went, as some miracles were. It's not over the next several days. It is instant. And only when she stepped out in faith did she experience the miracle of healing, which leads me to your first big truth grenade today. If you're a note taker, you're home, write this down. Sometimes you've got to step out in faith to see the miracle. Ooh, this is hitting somebody today. Sometimes you've got to step out in faith. The woman steps out in faith. She reaches out. She touches the hem of Jesus' robe. Just doesn't even touch him. And this completes her act of faith. And that is when the miracle is unleashed. Think about that. What's God calling you to step out and do? What is it? You know. There's something Somebody listening right now is on the precipice of making a huge decision. And you're wondering about your faith. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Mother Teresa. Wait, okay. Have you ever heard of the counterpart, Brother Andrew? Does anybody recognize Brother Andrew? Okay, all right. If you haven't heard of Brother Andrew, holy cow. He is known as God's smuggler. 
And he would go behind the Iron Curtain all into the Soviet, the atheistic, communistic countries and these socialist countries that were against Christianity. And he would try to smuggle as many copies of God's word as he could into these countries because they were desperate and they couldn't have them. And you could be thrown in jail if you were caught with them. They were highly illegal. So on this particular trip, Brother Andrew is approaching a guarded checkpoint on the, Rom on the Romanian border. And as he pulls up, he knows immediately something's wrong. Now there is a line of cars four deep in front of him. And each one is being stopped and searched. But what makes him nervous is that his Volkswagen Beetle is absolutely jam-packed with Bibles. And there's no, he's got them hidden under the seats, in the trunk, false gas tanks, false doors, everywhere. But he watches as each car in front of him, the driver is escorted out, they begin to tear out the seats, they begin to tear, take off the hubcaps, examine the engine, take parts of the engine out, and lay everything on the ground and inspect it while the man stands there and has to give an explanation for this. And these are people who are not smuggling anything. And he sees the car ahead of him go. And finally the next one, it's taken hours. The car just in front of him is going through the most intensive, it is taking 60 minutes to destroy this car looking for illegal contraband. Brother Andrew has a choice. And he sits there and he whispers a prayer. Dear Lord, what am I going to do? And his heart starts to race. He says, God, I know there is no amount of cleverness on my part that can hide your word. I know there is nothing I can do in his heart. And he sees the guard motion him to pull forward. And he says, Lord, dare I step out in faith and ask you for a miracle in this moment. And then the most amazing thing happens. A thought races through his mind that goes against everything we think. And it says, I want you to take the Bibles out of hiding and I want you to put them on the seat beside you where they cannot be missed. Uh, Lord, I'm going to ask for a repeat on that because I, I think I misheard you. Are you saying you want me to expose all of these hidden Bibles, the places where I hide them, and put them on the seat where this atheist guy with the AK-47 is going to arrest me. Too late for an answer. He pulls up and the guard comes next to him and the unthinkable happens. He hands him his papers, there's all the Bibles, and he goes to open the door and the guard shuts the door and then puts his knee against the door holding it closed. He looks in the car, sees the Bible, sees everything. There's no way he can hide him. Hands his papers back to Brother Andrew and says, proceed. Brother Andrew is so shocked, he doesn't know if he means proceed or pull over. So he begins to ease forward, looking for a place to pull the car over so that the interrogation and the tearing apart of his vehicle can begin. And as he looks in the rearview mirror, he notices the guy is motioning the next car forward. He has his foot right over the brake so that he could do this at any minute, and nothing happens. Not even a second glance. They begin to stop the car behind him, pull out the driver, tear his car apart, and search him. His inspection was less than 30 seconds in a line of hours. And in that moment, Brother Andrew was so shocked that this gigantic act of faith avoided certain disaster, and he was able to go and to complete the mission unhindered. Only when he stepped out in faith did the miracle get unleashed. Just like the lady who reached and touched the hem of that garment. Look what happens next because it's unique in all of Jesus' miracles. Look at verse 30. It says this. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. So he turned around to the crowd and he said, Who touched my clothes? Who touched my clothes? What a bizarre response. I want you to notice those first two words right there. At once. Now, those are the same two Greek words used in verse 29 where she was healed at once, immediately. It was this boom, boom. She felt it. He felt it. This is incredible because this is not some little puff of power like, ooh, this is tingles. <laughs> Somebody touched me. This was a what happened. In fact, the Greek word used here is dunamis. Y'all remember that? It's where we get the word dynamite from. It's that dunamis, dynamic power. It is explosive power. And Jesus was walking and the crowd was jostling. And all of a sudden, boom, who touched me? What happened? It was just incredible. Nowhere in scripture does Jesus react like this ever again. It's just 
this miracle, this one special miracle. And I love that because there's something else he does that is so unique. It only happens here. So, right, so Jesus has this dunamis power. I love this. He, he feels the power go out. He heals someone. And then he asks the bizarre question that stuns his disciples. Who touched me? <laughs> All right. Who touched me? All right. Look at verse 31. I want you to notice the response of the disciples. Master, you see the crowd of people all around you against you. And yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Did you catch that? As I was studying this this week and I was praying about this, I saw something I had never seen before. Oh, this is so good. I saw something I had always missed. Notice Jesus' response to his disciples. Notice his response. He completely ignores them. He absolutely ignores their misguided response. He doesn't stop. He doesn't look at them and explain why he's doing this or why he's asked questions. He doesn't justify why he's delayed in his trip to go heal Jairus, which is what I thought we were going to do, Master. He doesn't do any of that. He totally ignores them. And that is your next truth grenade. Keep going with the mission that God has given you. If there are distractors, there will be people, hear me, especially as the days grow darker, there will be people who do not understand why you do what you do. Especially if you're a follower of Christ. At home, hear me say that. There are people who will question why you do what you do and why you don't do what you do. Do not be distracted. Follow the mission God has given you. Don't be swayed to the left. Don't be swayed to the right. Stay on the mission. If God has called you to do something, you answer to him. You don't answer to a committee. You don't answer to a boss for this. You, don't, you ultimately answer to him. Keep going with the mission God has given you. Do not let the crowd sway you from what he's called you to do. So Jesus says, who touched me now? We've seen the response of the disciples. Check out the response of the woman. Look at verse 33. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear. She told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. It's so amazing. You know what's cool about this? This miracle is also recorded in Matthew chapter 9, I believe. We learn more about this humble, awesome lady. This is where we learn a few details that she was obviously meek and very humble because she quietly chooses to sneak up from behind Jesus. She doesn't interrupt him. She doesn't try to get his attention. She literally says, I'm not even going to stop him from doing the important things, healing other people, going about it. She sneaks up, and she chooses to touch, not his shoulders, she chooses to touch the hem of his garment, almost as if, if I can just get near Jesus and touch the dirty tip of his robe, that is enough. I'll be healed. The nasty, despicable part where the tassels dragged into the mud. If I can just touch that, I will have my miracle. I will be healed. I don't need to mess with him. I don't need to bother him. I don't need to. It's almost as if her faith is so certain she gets this, that just being near Jesus, if I believe and I have faith, my miracle will happen. And I love the response. Look how tenderly Jesus says, he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Do you know this is the only time in Scripture Jesus addresses a person as daughter? Think about that. Look at the tender and the compassion. Daughter, he, she's trembling. When's the last time you were so scared that you trembled? I can think of two times in my whole life that I was genuinely so scared that I was shaking. She was trembling. She hadn't done anything wrong. She was probably cowering in a heap now saying, what is going on? And he says, no, no, no. daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. That's a beautiful Hebrew traditional blessing at the time. But he doesn't end there. He goes on to say, be freed from your suffering. Notice this. He goes the extra step. I love this about you, Jesus. He goes the extra step and he reassures her, your cure is permanent. It's not just going to come back. I'm not trying to take money from you. I'm not asking you for a thing. Keep your money. It's not, it's not a temporary reprieve. Be freed. No more people taking advantage of you. No more emptying your bank account. All that is behind you, daughter. Be freed. Go in peace. Think how radically different her life was because of her faith. So you know I got to ask. You know I got to bring this home. 
Is your life any different because of your faith? Or are we content to just go through the motion? May I be honest? Nod your head if I could be honest here. Okay? All right? Tion, I'll leave it up to you if you want to pause this or not. I want to be honest. This era is revealing who is committed to Christ. You will see people on the fringes fade away. And the core will be left. There will be people who you will never see again. This has revealed it. This has revealed some things of people who are happy to disappear. People, and I'm not talking about just online. I'm talking about in faith. People who have walked away as they see there will be people come and say, do you subscribe to the ways of Jesus? One day, we read scripture. There is coming a time where you will be asked, you take a mark. Do you subscribe to Caesar? Think about the commitment level of your faith. How bold would you say your faith in Christ is? As the days grow dark, we already see it overseas. We already see people being put in jail. We already see people being whipped. There were people beheaded over the weekend. We see this only because they claim the name of Christ. She stepped out in faith, and her life was radically changed. And I have to ask, is there anything radical about us? This weekend, we have some people from our church, we're going to pray for them in just a minute, who are going up on our behalf to be on their face before God, to join millions of people up on the National Mall to pray for healing, for reconciliation, for repentance for our country, for our world. And there are some people who won't walk across the street to do that. Let me ask you a question. I know we got a lot of young people. I know Wednesday night, this is absolutely packed, overflowing. They didn't even have room for them all. And I, to the teenagers, I want to ask you a question. How do you feel when you ask for something from the Lord and you don't get it? How do you feel, how do you respond when you don't get what you want? I mean, it can be something big, or maybe it's something tiny, you know? Maybe your family doesn't want to go to a restaurant that you really want to go to, or you can't download that game that you really want to download. It's MA or whatever, and that's not allowed. Or maybe it's something huge. Maybe your whole year has turned upside down. You didn't get asked to that prom thing, because it wasn't a prom. And he turned down your homecoming request. And it's kind of like, oh, man, I'm done. Why is God, I'm upstairs in my room, if you need me, bring me all the cheeseburgers, pizza, and tissues, I'm not coming out for nothing. Take it a step farther. As you think about a specific situation you didn't get, how did you react? Were you hurt? Were you shocked? Were you maybe a little disappointed with God? Let me ask a big question. This is for everybody. Is God still good if he doesn't give you what you want? Is God still faithful? and worthy of your worship if he doesn't do what you're asking him to do. Because how we react reveals our spirituality. It reveals our maturity. If we pout and we come back and say, God, you can have everything. Well, not this. <laughs> I trust you in every area. Well, I don't trust you here, Lord. Think about when Mary and Martha had their brother who was on their deathbed. When Lazarus was so sick they came to Jesus and said, hey, he's going to die. Will you please come heal? They didn't even say his name. They just said the one you love. He knew. This was not somebody he kind of knew. This is his buddy who had that private room they could hang out. This was somebody he loved to be with. And he said, okay, great. And he stuck around for two more days not doing what they asked. These were best friends with Jesus. How would you feel if you presented your request to Jesus? Says, would you please come? So-and-so is dying. The one you love is, is hurt. And he's like, be right on that. And then he goes and he heals other people for two whole days. How would you feel about that? Would you be a little hurt? A little disappointed? Why? Because he didn't act on your, your timeline. And that's the whole thing. God still knows what he's doing. Jesus revealed that. He said, by the way, this sickness will not end in death. It's for the glory of God that the Son of Man will be glorified. 
There it is. That's the hidden gem. God knows what he's doing even when we don't understand it. And that's where the maturity level comes in. Hear me, church. As the days grow darker, as you feel more and more pressure to be like everybody else and less more like Jesus, you are going to have to understand God is going to do some things on a timeline that is divine that you may find offensive. You may even find it different than what you pray for. God, I don't understand. And that's the thing. He has the ultimate timeline. He will show up when and how is best for him, for his glory. Now the question is, are you okay with that? Or, if we're being honest, do we want him to show up on our timeline to make my road easier? Pastor Bill and I were talking just this morning about some of the trials in there, the just, just daily living in other countries, and how we're, I don't, I don't want to go over there and do that. Man, it's hot. I'm going to sweat. <laughs> we think, really? That's the extent of my commitment? I don't want to go to Ghana because I might get hot? And we look at this and we think, Lord, Mary and Martha, they said, God, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. They, they literally came to his face and said, if you had been here, he would be dead. They waited two days. Maybe you're waiting two months. Maybe you're waiting two decades. Are you willing to wait and trust that God is still faithful? Are you willing to step out and say, God, I put my trust in you. I don't put it in a political party. I don't put it in a person. I put my trust in you. See, Jesus even struggled with this one time. Luke 22, 42 says, Father, I don't want to do this, but if you're willing, would you please take this cup away from me? Would you please spare me this suffering? But he didn't end it there. He goes on to say, nevertheless, and there it is, not my will, but yours be done. So if Jesus had to have faith and trust the will and the plan of the Father, I think you are in good company. Take heart. You are not alone. We have to remember God is still good, even when we have doubts, even when we don't see the full picture. Let me show you what I mean with a, a modern day example. Anybody know who John Stott is? incredible evangelist and pastor and teacher and author. He had more impact on the modern church than you will even know. Great guy, friends with Billy Graham. And, and this guy was so passionate about following Jesus and sharing his truth. But he had another hidden passion, bird watching. Jason also has a passion for bird watching. Jason, why don't you come on up, buddy? I, I wanna, we'll, we'll, we're going to end, end it a little differently today. Over the years, John Stott documented sighting over 2,500 different species of birds. I thought there was five. <laughs> 2,500 birds. I was like, I got white bird, blue bird, red bird, eagle, something like that. <laughs> he has 2,500 different species of bird, but there was one that he loved more than any. One that was so passionate about elusive, he went all over the planet trying to, check, to, to, to capture an image of him, just to track it down. And it was this beautiful, rare, elusive, majestic snow owl. Oh my goodness, it's so cool, so pretty, and don't let their size fool you. They're, they're these beautiful, waddling things, and they, they're so hard to find. They're, they're only found in the Arctic tundra regions, northern Canada, northern Eurasia. And these incredible, rare, majestic snow owls were what he was looking for for years and years and years. And he would pray, God, would you please let me see this before I die? I'm getting older. He got a tip in 1979 that two, a pair, had been spotted, these gorgeous, majestic birds, somewhere off of the Arctic wilderness. So he chartered a helicopter to fly him and his friends up to drop them off in the middle of the wilderness where they had just been rumored to have been. He spent days scouring this wilderness in hopes of finding these giant blue majestic owls. And he never did. He had a tip and he was so elated and they only ended up being deflated and he came back home and he said, I don't know if I can do that again. For years he went on looking for it. Fast forward to the summer of 1991, he gets another tip head to Victoria Island. He takes his buddies. They're going on this camping trip off the northern coast of the mainland Canada. And he has his binoculars. And he looks over and he sees up against the sky 
two massive white shapes. And he thinks, oh my goodness, is that them? Guys, load up. It's 1991, okay? He's not a spring chicken now. And he's traipsing through the tundra, trying to get there. By the time he gets there, <sighs> they're gone. Did he even see it? Or was it something else that looked like it? He's almost given up. He's been waiting a long time for this moment. Fast forward five more years, July of 1996, he returns to Victoria Island. He's got his binoculars. This time he's got his friends. And he says, we're going out in the woods. We're not coming back till we see one. I'm claiming this. We are stepping out in faith. I'm going to find a stupid bird. He's got his binoculars. And he's scanning. And they're driving him. And he's driving over this four by four stuff. And he's looking. And he says, stop the car. Do you see what I see? And they zoomed in. They stopped. They were only three or four miles into the woods when there they spotted an authentic pair of snow owls. He had finally seen it. He was so amazed. You can just imagine the tears streaming down his face after all these years of waiting. And then they disappeared. So we got to follow. We got to follow. They pick up the trail and it gets even better. He follows them and he sees them going. They're headed to their nest, their lair. And as he looks closer, he says, no. Oh, Lord, you would not bless me like this. Hands the binoculars over and he says, do you see what I see? I count eight white, oblong-shaped eggs in this nest. And he says, let me count. And his friend goes and he says, I only count seven. I'm sure there were eight. I count seven because they're hatching. And he got to see the dream. Look how cute they are. No, you can't have one. <laughs> and over the next few hours, they built a blind and they hid and they just sat there, tears streaming down their face. Oh my goodness. And he got to see all of them born, these cute little cuddlies. All because he had patience and he had faith. It was tried. It was dark. In fact, he even quoted tongue in cheek. He said, I feel like noble Simeon at the temple in his old age, about to die. But he said, Lord, if you would just let me live long enough to see the salvation of the Jews, would you please let me see baby Jesus? And he did. He said, I looked up. I said, Lord, I can die a happy servant, for I have seen my snowy eagles, my, my owls. Think about this. He got to watch Mama come back and care for her brood. But his obsession goes a lot deeper than some bizarre, eccentric hobby. It reflects his theology. He says, and he wrote a book about this, if God can care for the tiniest of these birds, he can care for me. And he can care for you. We can put our trust in him because he is faithful. He is good. He is just. And he knows what he's doing. Do you have the faith? If not, you can ask him. He's a rewarder of those who seek him. You can pray for that. You can be like a centurion and say, I do believe, but God, would you help my unbelief? Would you increase my faith? You can do that. He welcomes that. You're his child. You have that connection. And he longs to give you what you ask for when you pray according to his will. Would you do that? Let's just bow right where you are. Just eyes closed. Just relax before the Lord. God, would you increase our faith? As the days grow darker and the the animosity from the enemy will ratchet up. Lord, help us to rest in you, knowing that you see it all. Nothing has caught you off guard. Nothing surprises you. You are still just as faithful as you were back in the days of Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as you are today. So Lord, we trust you. Help us overcome our doubt as we walk in faith. And if you take care of the tiniest of birds, how much more precious in your sight are we? that you would send your son Jesus to die for us. Lord, we receive that. Father, if there's somebody who's listening today who's never taken that step, God, would you knock at their heart right now? If that's you and you feel your, your spirit quicken with that conviction inside you, would you just open your heart and tell the Lord, God, I believe. I repent of my sin. I agree with you that my sin has separated me. I'm not asking you to come live in my heart or do some temporary thing. Lord, I want you to invade my soul. Take control. Be my master. Be my Lord. 
From this day forward, Holy Spirit, would you take up residence and seal my heart for the day of redemption when we are all joined together again. God, I thank you that your word says that we pray and we mean every word that we are saved. Thank you for that. God, I pray for the brothers and sisters in the sound of my voice that you would lift their burdens. I pray that you would give them peace during storms. God, I pray for their health. I pray for their finances. I pray for their marriages. I pray for their children. I pray for their salvation of their friends and families who haven't yet come to know you during this time. God, would you use us? Help us to not care what anyone else thinks except for what you think. To be bold. To be filled with love and compassion. To share the truth with those who need to know it. God, don't begin with them. Begin with us. Pour out your spirit on your church so that we can be the lighthouse you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.